everyone. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. A very momentous uh, event happened, at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, last year with the release of a new retreat, or, or I should say an old retreat, released in English for the first time. Uh, that was given by Karol Wojtyła, the future Pope St. John Paul II, in Poland in 1962 to a group of artists. This is something that I hadn't even heard of before. I don't think many people knew about it, but um, it makes a wonderful compliment to his letter to artists, but also to uh, his work on the theology of the body. And it really it really fits in uh, very seamlessly with his his whole thought as a philosopher, his thought as an artist. Um, so I was very excited to get my hands on this thing. And uh, it's been published by the Theology of the Body Institute, along with commentary by uh, the president of the Theology of the Body Institute, Christopher West, and also some reflections by some other thinkers and artists in the book after the retreat itself, which is about 60 pages long. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, talk about this retreat in today's episode with my guest, uh, the aforementioned Christopher West. Again, he's president of the Theology of the Body Institute. He's a professor of theological anthropology uh, in its master's program in collaboration with Pontifex University. He's lectured all over the world, written many best-selling books, uh, very popular speaker and popularizer of St. John Paul II's thought, particularly about the theology of the body. Welcome to the show, Christopher. Thomas, I'm really pleased to be with you, and I'm particularly pleased to be speaking with an artist who has a, a real interest in this retreat. I've done a lot of interviews about this retreat, but not yet specifically with, with an artist. So I'm gl really glad oh, to great. be on Catholic Culture Podcast here. Oh, great. Right. Well, um, yeah, well, I'm interested in the, re the content of the retreat itself, but also in the story of, of how this thing got published, because um, when I heard about it, I was like kind of blown away that we had such a thing. Uh, uh, you and me both. I first learned, I mean, I'm a student of John Paul's work. I have read everything I can get my hands on that John Paul II has written. And I only learned, and I've been studying his work since the early 90s. I only learned of the existence of this retreat in 2016 when I was reading a book by a former professor of mine and a personal friend of John Paul II's named Stanislaw Griegel. And his book on John Paul II's thought mentioned that there was this retreat that Wojtyla gave to artists in 1962 and that, that it formed a single whole with the theology of the body. Well, that piqued hmm. my interest right away. I contacted a friend of mine who lives in Poland, and I said, do you know about this retreat? And he said he didn't, but he could, he could do some research for me. He found it. It's published in Polish. It hadn't been translated into any other languages. I found someone who could translate it for me into English just with a private translation, and I devoured it once I got my hands on this, this private translation. That was like 2017. And I mm -hmm. knew then... This has to come to the English speaking world. We contacted the Vatican. We went through all the, the hoops you have to go through to get the special permission to publish a work of, of a deceased Pope and translate it more officially into a different language. We did all that work and we are so happy and delighted to be presenting for the very first time in English this marvelous hidden gem of the great St. John Paul II called God is Beauty. It's just marvelous. And here we are in Lent. This retreat was given in 1962 during Holy Week. And that mm -hmm. is very significant. So, and I want to add this. It's, it's, it is directed specifically to artists, but I, I, let me quote from the back cover of the book. Uh, Not all of us are called to be artists in the specific sense of the term, Carol Wojtyla says. Yet, as Genesis has it, all men and women are entrusted with the task of crafting their own life to make it a work of art. So this is applicable to all of us because we're all called to be the artists of our own life. And that right. is to become saints. And this retreat can help us all to do precisely that, to become saints. I think that I, I've heard that you describe the theology of the body uh, somewhere as some kind of a, like a theological time bomb Not waiting I. to that's, go off that's in the George church. George Weigel. Let me stop you right there. George Weigel. George Weigel says, Apologies. I quoted it many, many times, but that comes okay. from, 
from George Weigel. The, the, the theology of the body is a kind of theological time bomb set to yes. go off with dramatic consequences, perhaps in the 21st century. That comes out of Weigel's biography of JP2. Gotcha. So uh, the reason I bring it up is I find it, I kind of feel that way um, to some extent with regard to his writings on art and his work a as an artist, his own plays and poems. Um, I haven't read too much of the poetry. I've read his collected plays, but they're now out of print, which is bizarre to me. The collected plays, I yes, mean, yes. Um, and we're, we're in need of a new translation. And thankfully, as you know, Catholic University of America Press is has just begun their, you know, complete critical works of uh carol voitiwa yes, that's very and, exciting isn't it yeah i'm in i'm in the middle of person and act <laughs> right now it's very difficult but it's it's definitely rewarding it's um i've i've, I've actually never read theology of the body yet i've read love and responsibility mm -hmm. and now i'm reading person and act so i'll read theology of the body eventually i'm sure but um anyway what i was saying is that i feel that uh, St. John Paul II's his letter of artist to artists is quite well known, but his own work as an artist is um, – there's been times when it's – some of his plays have been performed or filmed, but right now, they're, you know, I'm not really hearing too much about it. But I really like to see that come more to the forefront as well. I mean the fact that this, this man was an artist himself and that really comes out especially in part – two of this five part in these five reflections by John Paul II. I think that most of all, it comes out in that part where I, he really gets into the details of the experience of the artist. Yes, I agree. It, it is very important that we understand before John Paul II even entered seminary, he was an artist. He was resisting communism through the Rhapsodic Theater in Poland. Yeah. And he could have been killed for what he was doing. And isn't it fascinating right. that of all of the attempts to resist tyranny, this young future saint chose the arts. It's fascinating. And here, let's fast forward to 1962. And communists, you know, the Nazis left uh, in the mid 40s and mm -hmm. in come the communists. Wojtyla is now a priest. He's then a bishop. It's 1962. Communists are still ruling Poland. And this retreat he gave to artists during Holy Week of 1962 was an act of resistance of tyranny. Wojtyla mm -hmm. understood that if he could empower artists, that this was an act of resistance of tyranny. Isn't it interesting that when tyrants take over a culture, they typically put to death the artists. Why is this? Because the tyrants understand that the artists are the ones who keep the culture alive. And if you're trying yeah. to destroy a culture, you have to destroy the artists of that culture. So Wojtyla is, this is an act of defiance of tyranny to give a retreat to the artists of Poland in 1962 when they are under communist rule. We have to understand that. The, 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 the tyrants will either kill the artists or they will manipulate the artists to serve their own propaganda. And Wojtyla understood all of these dynamics, and in the midst of this, he is preaching the gospel to artists. He is calling these artists to holiness so that their art can be a means of cultural resistance. It is, it is very important yeah. that we understand that context. I think that it's in uh, – I think it might be in his book, Rise, Let Us Be Go On Our Way, that um, he said that Poland at a number of times had survived for quite a long time uh, without having a political state yes. because it survived as – the nation was in the culture. Yes, the culture I think was he talks kept about alive that. by yeah. handing on, among other things, language and the arts. This is critical. This is critical to keeping a culture alive. And we can, we can apply the same to what's going on, Thomas, in our own day when mm. uh, ever so rapidly we are, we are under tyranny. There is an ideology being promoted in a tyrannical way in our society, and it's using mm. propaganda to do that, the manipulation of artists. If we can reach artists with the, 
with the truth of what it means to be human. And artists come alive with the truth of what it means to be human. Then their art can bring about a renaissance, a renewal, uh, an evangelization. And Pope after Pope after Pope in the modern world has said, we cannot evangelize without artists. Art is absolutely yeah. indispensable, indispensable to, the munica- to the communication of the gospel message. And, and that's why Wojtyla gave so much of his time to sh- forming and shaping artists, including this retreat. So um, I, I wonder if we have any idea who was in attendance there in 1962. I, towards the end, he mentions that there will be you know about a dozen priests available to hear confessions. So there must have been a fair amount of people there. D- do we know anything about who was there? I guess it was mostly Polish artists, I, right? I would have to do more research to understand that. It. I think we can conclude it was a group of Polish artists. I I don't imagine people were traveling outside of Poland to come to this retreat. In 1962, Wojtyla was just a local bishop. He was not known on the global scene. He was sort of beginning to make inroads in philosophical circles as a philosopher and ethicist. But he, he, he first really made a name for himself in the international church during the Second Vatican Council. And this was just prior, this was six months prior to the start of the Second Vatican Council. So Mm -hmm. that's an astute observation that you made, Thomas, that because there, he mentions there were about a dozen priests ready to hear confessions, that would indicate that there is a fairly large number of most likely Polish artists gathered to hear this retreat during Holy Week of 1962. I I love that you picked up on that. (laughs) Um, so before we get into the substance of the retreat, do you want to tell people about the, the way this book is put together? Sure, sure. So it begins uh, with a, an introduction from yours truly. Oh, I should say, I'm sorry. I should say the title of the book is God is Beauty, a Retreat on the Gospel and Art. I didn't actually say say that the, the way you titled yes, quite it. quite all right. Sorry, this, was, this was actually the title that was given to us by the Vatican. So... Um, we loved it. We're we're very yeah. glad they gave us this title. We think it accurately captures the essence of what John Paul II is trying to communicate. God is beauty. Let, let's just start there. Mm. And lesson one of the retreat, there are five lessons. Lesson one unfolds what this means that God is beauty. And Wojtyla unfolds, does the gospel say explicitly that God is beauty? He says, maybe not explicitly, but it does say that God alone is good. And then Wojtyla gives us a beautiful reflection on the convertibility of the good and the beautiful. If God is good, if God is the good, God is also beauty. If God is ultimate good, God is also ultimate beauty. And so we're touching on the transcendentals here, the true, the good, and the beautiful. Each one of those stands or falls together. You can't subtract the true from the good and the beautiful. You can't subtract the good from the true and and the beautiful. You can't subtract the beautiful from the true and the good. These are all so intimately interrelated Mm -hmm. that to say God is true and is the truth and God is the good is also to say God is ultimate beauty. So... The essence of the retreat makes, or the, excuse me, the retreat makes up the essence of the book, but it's framed by an introduction again that I wrote, and then by a commentary that I wrote. But then we invited other thinkers and artists, theolo- theologians and artists, to give various reflections on each of the five sessions of the retreat, and then we have towards the end of the book uh, an interview with the artist uh, Donnie McManus. And then there's a conclusion. Great guy. Oh, he's a great guy. If if you're not familiar with the work and art of Donnie McManus, please look it up. He's he's really bringing about a renewal of the arts in the modern church uh, based on John Paul II's Theology of the Body. And then the conclusion of the book is a reflection again from me on art and the new evangelization how will beauty save the world? Um, I, but let me let me just go through some of the summary points, key points of each of these five lessons. Lesson one 
from the retreat of sure. by Voiti, what is called Discover the Beauty of God. And I would say the highlight here is a reflection that Voitiwa gives on an experience he had as a young priest. He was studying in Rome, and he, he took a tour of the Diocletian Baths. Do you remember this scene, Thomas, from reading the retreat, where he talks about studying these mm -hmm. sculptures of the ancient Greek masters? And he says, it took such a great effort. It was a very difficult and laborious day studying these sculptures of the Greek masters. And let's let's just be plain here about what he was studying. These were the, the sculptures of these idealized images of the naked human body. And you might think a young holy Catholic priest, when he encountered these naked statues or these statues of, of naked human bodies, might run the other way. But no, he, he pressed in. And he says, I wanted to understand what these Greeks were looking for. And by pressing in, he says, mm -hmm. and this is fabulous. He says, I came to understand the gospel better. And I came to understand the gospel anew. And I realized after such great effort, and, and I think that's important. He's not entering into this willy nilly. He's in a spiritual battle. He's really trying to enter into what is the truth behind these statues? What are they really looking for? And I think we can yeah. admit there's an idolatry going on here, uh, similar to the idolatry in the modern world towards the human body. You know, they didn't have in the ancient world, they didn't have photography or video, but they did have sculpture. And and Voitiwa, much like St. Paul, remember the scene in the Acts of the Apostles when Paul goes into Athens and he, he says, I encountered yeah. their idols. And then it says, Paul studied them intently. Right? John Paul II is doing something very similar. Why? Here's a very important truth. Behind every idol is the desire for the true God gone awry. And so when Paul marches into Athens, having studied their idols, he doesn't wag his finger and shame them and condemn them. He says, rather, I see you are a very religious people. Now let me announce to you the God you're really looking for. Voitiwa was doing something very similar here. In studying these ancient sculptures of the naked body, he concludes they were looking for perfect beauty manifested in the human body. And then it dawns on him. He has right. this moment of, of epiphany where he realizes that perfect beauty has indeed been manifested in the human body. It's called Christmas. <laughs> it's called the incarnation. It's called Christianity. And, he's, and this is when he says, this is how I came to understand the gospel more deeply. What they were looking for was the mystery of the incarnation. They were looking for the mystery of perfect beauty manifested in the flesh. To that, Thomas, I just want to say, alleluia. Yeah, and this is why he says the gospel is such a, a source of creative inspiration throughout the ages for artists, Correct. because... Because he starts this retreat out with uh, by pointing out that God is beauty, he, he makes sort of an interesting argument, an analogical argument based on uh, you could say a metaphysical argument based on the passage uh, where uh, a young man calls Jesus uh, good, good master or something like that, and Jesus yes. says, "Good, nobody, nobody, good but teacher, only God yes. is good," um, and uh, and and so. By analogy, you know, by the ana transcendental analogy or whatever you want to call it, he says, well, it, he could have also said nobody but God is beautiful. Um, and Correct. so uh, the reason the incarnation is such an inspiration for artists throughout the ages is that it links up this bodily experience that we have with the source of beauty itself. Um, so it's it's the it's the um, the source of beauty being. Um, united with the um, 
the the finite reflection of that source. Correct. And this brings us beautifully, just as you're connecting the dots here beautifully, Thomas, with the theology of the body of John Paul II and why Stanislaw Griegel said that this retreat to artists forms a single whole with the theology of the body. And here's why. I, I draw this out more extensively in the commentary, but both art and the human body have the same goal, which is to make visible what is invisible. Art, the goal of art is to, to make visible through color, through form and shape, or through sound with music, or in architecture, or in words such as poetry and literature, to, to, to make communicable the incommunicable meaning God, the realm of the spirit, the, the, the realm of the divine. God is invisible. And yet, St. John can tell us that the word of God, the invisible God, he's seen it with his eyes. He's touched it with his hands. What made the invisible God visible? Precisely the mystery of the human body, the incarnation. And so in the thesis statement of John Paul's Theology of the Body, he says, the body and only the body is capable of making visible what is invisible, the hmm. spiritual and the divine. Right. And he goes on to say, the body has been created by God to transfer into the visible reality of the world the mystery hidden in God from eternity and thus to be a sign of it. Okay, well, what does that mean? That might just sound like a bunch of word salad to a lot of people. What we're getting at here is that the human body, precisely in the sexual difference, reveals the mystery of God. Okay, well, what does the sexual difference reveal? Very plainly, a man's body does not make sense by itself, and a woman's body does not make sense by itself. But seen in light of each other, we see the call to holy communion, a holy communion that quite literally brings life to the world. What yeah. we discover here in our creation as male and female in the call of the two to be fruitful and multiply, we discover the Trinitarian image. Not that God is sexual. John Paul is very clear on this. The catechism is very clear on this. God is not sexual. But our sexuality, meaning our creation as male and female and the call to be fruitful and multiply, is a sign in the created world of the fact that God, from all eternity, the Father is generating the Son in order to share with him the love of the Holy Spirit. This is who God is. And our bodies tell that story theology of the body why do you think it is that uh in ephesians 5 saint paul um rather than going the trinity that trinitarian route that you just described instead focuses on christ in the church which is usually yes. the way that this marriage relationship is described as an analogy yes. john paul ii brings in the trinitarian aspect later thomas you are very astute i really like that you asked that question uh seriously i i i uh I love interviewers who are astute, and um, I don't mean this to oh, be a slight you. to the many other interviewers I have interacted with, but it is rare that I have such an astute question, which delights me. Thank you. So let me put it to you this way. The movement goes in two directions. It, 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 let's start with the body. If we start with the body, the human body reveals a call to communion, as we've just said, and then you rightly linked it with Ephesians chapter 5, where St. Paul says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two will become one flesh. And then he says, that's a quote right out of, book, of the book of Genesis, but then he adds, mm -hmm. this is a mega mystery. I love the ring of the Greek there. This is a mega mystery, and it refers to Christ and the church. So our creation is male and female. In the call of the two to that intimate union, that's what starts the Bible, right? That's the very beginning of the Bible. The Bible begins with a marriage in an earthly paradise. 
But that's just a foreshadowing of the end of the story in the book of Revelation, which ends with a marriage in a heavenly paradise. And the marriage here is the marriage of Christ and the church. The entire reason we are male and female in the divine plan is to be a sign here on planet Earth of our eternal destiny. Here's the whole Bible in five words. God wants to marry us. He -hmm. wants to be one in the flesh with us. And he wanted that eternal marital plan to be so plain to us, so obvious to us, that he chiseled an image of it right in our bodies by making us male and female and calling the two to become one flesh. Again, this is a mega mystery and it refers to Christ and the church. But there's a further step we need to take. The purpose of the marriage of the Lamb is to graft the bride into union with the bridegroom so that Mm. we can be one body with Christ so that we can eternally share in the Trinitarian exchange of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm. This is the theology of the body. The call to communion as male and female is a sign that reveals our call to communion with Christ in one body. And the end goal of being one body with Christ is so that we can eternally be living the Trinitarian exchange, so that we can participate forever in the inner life of the Trinity. (laughs) This means our bodies are not only biological, our bodies are theological. They tell a divine story. And this is precisely why the enemy is after our bodies. More specifically, he's after the sexual difference to eliminate the sexual difference so that we no longer see the call to holy communion in the image of Christ in the church so that we're no longer aimed at our eternal destiny of participating in the life of the Trinity, but rather our twisted, disoriented experience of sexuality becomes more a foreshadowing of hell than a foreshadowing of heaven. So Satan's goal is to turn the great mystery of sexuality into a great misery. And oh man, has he been successful in the modern world in doing that. Yeah. Um, You know, it's interesting not to get too far away from the arts here, but it's interesting that John Paul II um, sometimes will choose a different um, symbolic meaning than the one that is most often traditionally ascribed to something in scripture. Not not to replace it, but as an addition. I mean, so, some people have found cause for complaint in this. I don't see it as a problem. I just see it as an, an, an further enriching. So for example, in addition to what we just talked about, the Trinitarian, in addition to the Christ and the church aspect to bodily difference, but there's also the fact that um, he goes to, in the theology of the body, instead of seeing... Um, uh, or in addition, I should say, to seeing God being made and a man being made in God's images in likeness, primarily in, in terms of his rational nature, he looks at it yes. more in terms of the communion of persons. So it's interesting. I'm sure, yes, obviously, he's not intending to replace the the, the more traditional reference there. But. He's, he's actually taking the traditional understanding to its logical conclusion. What is the purpose of our rational nature? What is the difference between us and the animals, right? Right. The difference between us and the animals, uh, let's look at it this way. We all know that the animals copulate and reproduce, but the copulation of animals is worlds apart from the joining of man and woman in one flesh. Right. Precisely because of our rational nature. We have freedom that the animals do not have. And what is the purpose? What is the end of that freedom? The end of that freedom is precisely to love in the image and likeness of God. And God himself is an eternal communion of life-giving love. God himself is an eternal communion. So there is no replacing of the tradition here. 
there is a drawing out of what tradition has taught us to its logical conclusion. Yeah, that the makes sense. The logical conclusion of our, of our rational nature is that we're called to love in the image of God. In other words, we are called to love in a communion of persons. Right. So, so it's not just so that we're important. called to reflect God by be, simply by being rational creatures. It's not, it doesn't end at our just reflecting God as an image. That image is to unite us with God. Boom. Exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, we have an unused potential, mm. right? The rational, put it this way. I'll, I'll quote John Paul II here. He says, freedom is the means to love. Yeah. Freedom is the means. Love is the end. When we, when we don't use our freedom for the sake of love, we end up having this rational nature for no good reason. Yeah. <laughs> our freedom or, or our intellect is no longer at the service yeah. of the end goal of loving as God loves. Yeah. Right? The, 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 the new commandment that Jesus gives us is love one another as I have loved you. That is not possible for those creatures who do not have a rational nature. So the end goal of the rational nature is the fulfillment of the commandment, love one another as I have loved you. And the way Christ has loved us is freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully in the image of the love that the Father has poured out on him. Yeah. And the way this is primarily, not solely, but primarily the way this is lived out is in the marital vocation. Right. There are other ways to live that same call to love, but that call to love, I think this is the great contribution of John Paul II's theology of the body, and theologians will be unpacking this for centuries, that John Paul recognizes the new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, has been chiseled right in our bodies mm. in the sexual difference. It's a call to holy communion. Right. That's how we are to love. Well, thank you for answering those questions. That's very helpful. Sure. Um, so to re return to the book then, um, I wanted to yes. note that um, in a couple of the different reflections given in this book um, uh, by others on uh, St. John Paul II's words, um, particularly those by – Bill Donahue and by Donnie McManus, there's reflections on the experience of being a visual artist and drawing from nude models and the way that you have yes. to train yourself to see. And I thought that was very yes. interesting. And, and that's something I've always wondered about, um, you know, um, that, for example, um, Oh, who's the uh, who's the David Clayton? You probably know know him. Uh, yes, who, I know he, David I Clayton teaches, very well. You know, he's he's argued against the use of new models, I believe, on his blog. But I always and I always wondered. I I was always a little bit ambivalent about the topic myself. But I think that um, Bill Donahue and Donnie McManus make a good case here. But that's not really my point. My point is that I resonate with this experience too, as someone who. First of all, my relationship with the human body has been pretty badly broken. Um, but also, yes. um, I mean, as is almost the case with everybody, you know. Uh, but, everybody. But, um, we are all raised in this pornographic culture, and it has right. warped the way we see things. But but um, something um, analogous has happened with me recently, um, which is that ballet has become a part of my life. I have a friend who's a dancer with the New York City Ballet, and so wow. I've had the opportunity to start going to the ballet regularly, which is something I had never done before. And so Beautiful. when I'm sitting there, especially if it's good, if it's the choreography is good, you know, I'm uh, – it's kind of a deep experience. It's It's hard to put a lot of it into words, but – I'm just finding myself challenged to see the human body and particularly the female body, of course, in a in a new way. Um, Beautiful. Uh, Beautiful. In a way that's that it's it's a way that I can relate to because I'm an artist, I'm a musician, and so um, I have the experience of like disinterested contemplation, and so that so I actually have this is a place where I can actually safely sort of try to exercise that, you know, yes. with the female body because it's transformed when it's good. It's not that the ballet can't be, um, you know, lewd ever, but, but when it's good, it's, it's done in such a way that transforms it in a way and transfigures the relationship that we have with the body. And so, um, that's been a profound, I've only been a few times so far, but it's been a profound experience. And, um, I think, I think that I'd like to keep going because I think that it will provide opportunity for, for healing for me 
uh, to continue Amen, to go and, and watch and watch the ballet. Um, yeah, so it's it's that's something that I really related to when they were talking about the experience of of working with nude models because I had a similar experience uh, attending the ballet. Thomas, thank you so much for sharing that from your heart. And and as I said just a moment ago, we we are all so wounded here. We we have been raised in a pornographic culture. And the the end goal of the pornographic culture is to blind us to the theology of our bodies. And and here's a very, very important principle of Catholic cosmology. If we get this wrong, we get the whole universe wrong. Here it is. I like to put it this way. The devil does not have his own clay. All Mm, he can do is take God's clay. And God looked at the clay that he made and said, behold, it is very good. The devil gets his hands on that good clay and he twists it up, right? And here I'm speaking specifically of the human body. The enemy is after the human body precisely because the sexual difference tells this divine story. And he gets his hand on the human body and he twists it up and turns it into something pornographic. And we can be very tempted here to fall into what John Paul II calls the Manichaean loophole to the requirements of the gospel. Let me explain. Manichaeism is the heresy that says the devil has his own clay, right? When we we believe that the physical world is evil and the spiritual world is good, spirit good, body bad, the body belongs to the devil. Sex is the devil's realm. We are giving the devil his own clay. That is the Manichaean heresy in its essence. Put it this way. It is easier when we encounter that twisted up clay, it is easier to throw that out the window and try to live a spiritual life divorced from our bodies. That's much easier than it is to Allow Jesus to come into that twisted up clay and untwist it. Yeah. That's why John Paul II says Manichaeism, spirit good, body bad, may and might always be a loophole to avoid the requirements of the gospel. And you just shared with us, Thomas, a beautiful experience in your own life of the Lord untwisting the clay. Your experience of the ballet is the experience of overcoming evil with good, right? Right. This is what St. Paul says. We overcome evil not by throwing the evil out the window or yelling at it or shaming it or scolding it. We overcome evil with good. And that beautiful portrayal of the human body in ballet is healing that twisted portrayal of the human body that wounded you and wounded me and in which this whole culture is immersed. Right. This and what you were why... just saying connects to uh, Voitiwa's discussion of moral minimalism later, where he says you have to be following the positive precepts and not just the negative pre- precepts of the gospel. You have to follow the great commandment and the Beatitudes as well as the, Preach it, uh, the Ten Commandments. But but before we Preach get there, I, there's something else I wanted to say about the ballet too, which is it's not just the experience of the human body taken in itself, but also ballet offers an opportunity to display eros uh, in a non-pornographic way. And, yes. and eros I, I, it can be taken in the broad sense, but here I mean specifically between a man and a woman yeah, and a the, and a woman, the yes. masculine feminine dynamic. And, and there are moments when I'm there and I think, oh, that's a little bit too much or they're going a little too far there in the choreography. So it's not that I'm not discerning or critical at any sure, time, but, sure, but, sure. Um, but, uh, but that I am – challenge and sometimes it's uncomfortable and sometimes you have to know is that am i uncomfortable because this is bad or because i'm being taken out of my comfort zone and so to see a man and a woman dancing together in and uh moving in ways that are not impure but we could say daring in a way that you know it wouldn't necessarily in, in in daily life be appropriate to dare you know in this way um but uh, that that also is that also is a part of it. So it really 
um, is it's kind of like the perfect art form for the theology of the of the body, you Thomas, know, in a way. I, I, I just want to affirm you as a brother. I, you are on a beautiful journey here and you're 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 looking to tune your guitar. And when you're tuning a guitar to get to the right note, sometimes you go a little sharp and then you go a little flat and you're back and forth yeah. until you are in tune. Right. That's what you I have to be willing doing. to risk. You have to be willing to risk the yes. the overshooting it. You have to be willing Correct. to take a shot to, to make it at all, you know, and Correct. and fix things as they need to be fixed as time goes on. You have to be able to risk mistakes. Yeah. And to put into a biblical example to it, we could say this, that the drama of the Christian life is not in the safety of the boat. It's in keeping your eyes fixed on Christ and getting your butt out of the boat and doing the impossible, walking on water with your eyes fixed on Christ. Might we sink if we get out of the boat? Yeah, we might. But it's better to get out of the boat and sink than never to get out of the boat. This is so mm -hmm. important. And, and we could also say it this way, that Christian purity must never be confused with Puritanism. And Puritanism is that fearful rejection of the body. Whereas St. John Paul II says, purity is the glory of the human body before God. And then he goes on, he says, in fact, purity is the glory of God in the human body through which masculinity and femininity are manifested yeah. what does jesus say he says blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see god where will we see god we will see god precisely manifested in and through the human body but here's the problem with impurity with impurity, we look but do not see, as Jesus says. What is the gospel invitation? The gospel invitation is come and become one who sees. Purity yeah. expands our vision. It does not narrow our vision. It opens our eyes to the glory of God revealed through the human body. And you are tasting right. that, Thomas, in your experience of the ballet. Certainly not perfectly, as you're admitting, but you're tasting it. And I can only say, keep going, brother. That's the journey. Discernment, absolutely. Uh, examination, being critical, absolutely. But without fear, pressing forward to understand how God's beauty is manifested in the human body. And you're doing exactly what John Paul II is saying in the retreat, taking that time and that laborious effort to understand what are we really looking for when we desire to behold the beauty of the human body. We're looking for the incarnation. That's what we're looking yeah. for. At the source and summit of everything we believe as Catholics is the body of Christ, and dare I say, the naked body of Christ given up for us on the cross, given to yeah. us sacramentally in the Eucharist. This is the source and summit of our faith, everything we believe. Uh, we have to work through our fears here and let perfect love cast out fear and let perfect love purify us of our impurities so that we can see the God who is beauty manifested in the fullness of time when God sent his son, a male child born of a woman. It is always male and female together that reveal this mystery. Right. So um, I don't think we'll probably have time to get through all the points in all of the sections of this retreat. Um, there's some really profound points in parts four and five. I'd, I'd like to focus on the first three sections because those are the ones that touch most directly on art. Um, yes. But uh, perhaps we can go to we, we've already covered section one a bit. Perhaps we can go to section two. And he he returns keeps returning to this quote from a Polish poet, uh, I think, from the 19th century, if I remember correctly, yes. uh, a stream of beauty flows through you, but you yourself are not beauty. Um, and the way that he uses this quote, which he says had haunted him for a long time, uh, is very interesting because it, it, it serves two functions reflect, reflecting on this. One is for artists to keep artists from idolizing their own works, 
or themselves. Yes. yes. Um, and to believe it to ascribe to humanity the ability to create from nothing. But yes. it also yes. keeps artists from downplaying um Correct. the nature of their creativity. Correct. Um, because what he's not saying is that we're just there, there there's a school of thought, and it's less popular today, but there's a school of thought that um, well, we shouldn't be so highfalutin. We're just craftsmen. You were following yes, yes. a rule, uh, and we're just craftsmen. And and that you can't neglect that aspect of it, that humble, you know, artisanal aspect of art, right? But but um but you have to acknowledge and, and at the beginning of this section he says that artists have to claim this about themselves, um, that they are conduits for beauty. Um yes. and so something beyond in a sense, even though it's a natural activity, something beyond human capacity uh, is occurring when a genuine work of art is made, which is that the human be the human being is acting as a conduit, not in a supernatural way, but in a natural way for the transcendental value of beauty, which belongs to God alone. Yeah, Thomas, you're putting your finger on it again. I I just want to I just want to affirm you for your astute read of this retreat. Um, this is critical when Wojtyla quoting from that 19th century poet says a stream of beauty flows through me but I am not beauty what's happening here the artist and all of us if we live in the image of God if we are truly living the human vocation what's going to happen is that we will become a channel through which God's beauty flows through us the temptation, the, 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 the lore of the enemy here is always to tempt us to believe that when we are that, experiencing that divine beauty flowing through us, to lay hold of it and say, it's mine. And, and I can right. speak from experience here. There are moments. And then that can, that can a, happen through false humility as well. Like I was saying with, oh, I'm just a craftsman. Yes. But that still gives you ownership. That gives you ownership and control over what you're doing in a way. That's right. That's right. False humility is just another form of pride. Right. Let's look. Right. Let's look to the most wonderful biblical example of true humility, which is Mary. Of, of course, Christ. But right. let's let's turn to Mary. She says, uh, you know. My soul magnifies the Lord. And she also says, all generations will call me blessed. This is no false humility. All generations will call me blessed. But she's recognizing precisely, she's living this line that Wojtyla quotes. Who more than Mary can say, divine beauty is flowing through me, but I am not that beauty. But I am literally, for Mary, she is giving flesh to that beauty. Her openness yeah. to being that channel of divine beauty literally puts flesh on that divine beauty and enables that divine beauty to be manifested to others. In her humility, she recognizes, I'm not doing this. My soul magnifies the Lord. But, oh, my goodness, am I ever blessed? And all generations will recognize I am blessed. There's true humility. Yeah. There's the living out of the true artist. And, and, and I want to link this, and I do in my commentary after the retreat. I'm commenting here on what, what Wojtyla says, that for the artist to be this conduit of beauty, he is going to go through labor pains. And he says that specifically, like yeah. he compares it to the pains of a woman giving birth. It's fitting. It's very fitting and, to be a true and, artist. And he says that talent is a gift for which uh, a talent is a gift for which one must pay one's entire life, which yes. is like, OK, Ooh. well, you know, an artist wrote that. Yep. You, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. An artist wrote that. That's not book knowledge. That's lived experience from Wojtyla. And we, yeah. can, we can say the same of every true artist in that broader sense that to make of our lives a work of beauty. In other words, to become a saint. Yeah, because this is our greatest talent as our humanity. Our, the, exactly. The greatest talent we have is to make our humanity a work of beauty. And here I want to draw from something Pope Benedict XVI said <laughs> at the first canonization of a saint 
as Pope, Benedict XVI said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but something like this, a saint is someone who has been pierced so deeply by God's truth and beauty that he's inwardly transformed into God's truth and beauty. That's what a saint is. A saint is someone who has been utterly seized by divine beauty. And so they become that divine beauty. And I'm going to link this also to another part of Wojtyla's retreat, where he talks about the humility of God. How does God respond to our pride? How does God punish our pride, if you will? Remarkably, God punishes our pride by humbling himself. What? By taking on flesh. I mean, look at the word humble. It's related to the word hummus, which means earth, soil, uh, humanity means we are of the earth, right? To be human, we are of the earth, human, hummus, humility. God literally humbles himself by taking on our humanity, by taking on hummus, by taking on flesh. This is God's response to our pride, to humble himself so that we could possibly learn in the midst of our pride what it means to be humble. How, oh my word, how, 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 do we, how do we, in our sinfulness, acquire that kind of humility? And here I'll draw from another point of the retreat where Wojtyla talks about the two touches. The two touches. What does he mean by these, the two touches? We have touched God by our sin, first of all. Right. But touching God with our sin, which leads to the crucifixion of the Son of God, at the same time, Christ is touching the Father with our humanity. And here, Wojtyla says, we have an entry point where we, united with Christ, giving our sinfulness to the crucified Christ, we can be touched by God in a healing, redeeming way. So we overcome sin not by pretending we don't have it, not by burying it and putting on a religious mask, not by moral minimalism and merely following the rules. Rather, we become humble. We become the men and women we're truly created to be. We become saints. By allowing our sinfulness to come into the light and receiving in our sinfulness that touch of God that heals, that touch of God that restores, letting God pour oil on our wounds. That's very different than just gritting and following the rules and putting on a pious mask. It means getting naked. It means exposing our broken humanity. And to quote from Christ, it means bringing our whole humanity, and here he's very explicit. Jesus says, make sure that no part of your body remains in the darkness, but that every part of your body comes into the light. Because if every part of your body comes into the light, your body will become a lamp that illuminates for you the meaning of your humanity. That's everything we're talking about here, about the relationship of art and the theology of the body and this beautiful retreat Wojtyla has given us, the path to holiness. That's what this retreat is all about, coming into the light with our real broken humanity so that we can become the redeemed men and women we are created to be. By the way, that's another thing I noticed about the ballet is that, you know, the dancers are using every single muscle in their body that muscles that I'm not even aware of, you know, and so it made me it makes me think like, well, how much of my capacities am I, are, are just remaining like petrified and rigid, like my human capacities are just remaining dead, you know, as, practically speaking, that I'm not even putting into use or that I don't even know that I have. Um so yeah, that 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 ballet is a great image for that as well. That, that well said, yeah. Thomas. Thank you. Um, you know what you're doing there. You're you know. Can I just comment on sure. that? Sure. 
what you're doing there, Thomas, is instructive for all of us. Because what you're doing there is you are allowing art to evangelize you. Good on you, brother. And, and this is exactly Wojtyla's point. We cannot evangelize without art. What does art do? Art is the language of the heart. And no evangelization can take place unless our hearts are pierced. Right. You are allowing that art form to pierce your heart and instruct you, evangelize you. That's powerful, brother. You are allowing Christ to reach your heart through art. It's beautiful. Well, I just want you. to affirm yeah, that. Praise God. So in, in the end of um, section two, he talks about, yeah, our, the greatest talent God has given us is our humanity. And so he proceeds in the third section to say that that's what, also what God is going to judge us on, not, any of, not on any of our works, but on our humanity. And he asks this question, what have I made of myself and what, I've, what have I done with myself? Um, and he goes in on to this discussion of conscience, which is very um, in line with what I've been reading in person and act. Um, he says that our conscience yes. establishes the value of our humanity for good or evil, and it forces us to create it continually. So he interestingly locates the conscience as like the prime area in which we uh, are creative in in crafting our, our human life. And he says that conscience makes use Correct. of our it's, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say that it, it, this this underscores the need for a properly formed conscience, because an improperly formed conscience will make an ugly work of art. Right, a properly formed conscience will will over time make our lives beautiful. Yeah, exactly. So he says that conscience makes use of our ex external conditions as its material, but even more so, it makes use of our inner life, our thoughts, our dispositions, and our feelings. And he, he, he from there, he goes into this discussion of Christian morality, which we already t touched on, so I don't know that we need to get too much into it, but this idea that uh, we, we need to be observing the the positive precepts on top of the negative ones, because otherwise we'll always be on the brink of sin, as he puts it. Um uh, right. He says sin doesn't come out of nowhere. Although... I, I would like to say a word about that. Yeah, sure. I, I I would like to say a word about that if if I could. Please. Um, he he says in there, this is my own paraphrase or summary, that basically we're putting the cart before the horse. He doesn't use that expression, but we are putting the cart before the horse when we just focus in on the rules. He says when we focus in on the rules of morality. We, we are looking at religion from a human perspective, and, and we start putting these burdens on our own shoulders. I must do this. I must believe this. I must act in this way. And it's not at all that he's saying we don't have responsibilities, but rather he's saying when we look at religion from God's perspective, everything changes because the first movement is a movement of opening my poverty to God's riches. And the riches that God pours out on me, they are precisely his love. I have to get in touch. This is religion. I have to get in touch with my abject need for perfect love. And then I will realize I can't find that in this world. Right. And it will compel me to open up to the God who loves me perfectly. And when I open up to that love, and to the degree that I let that love come into me, then morality becomes not a list of rules to follow. It becomes a living out of the love that I've received. But here's a basic principle. You cannot give what you do not have. Yeah. If our posture is not first one of receiving that love, we're never going to be able to give it. Right. And if we're trying to give that love by following the moral rules, without having first received that love, then eventually we're going to resent the rules and abandon them because you can't give what you don't have. And he makes this very interesting psychological comment. He says that sin doesn't come out of nowhere, but moral minimalism can make it appear that way, like like to, to make sin appear as just something I did, you know? 
Uh, but he says that sin yes. has roots in an internal disorder deep in the person in a lack of depth. And he specifically points out, as you were saying, the lack of effort towards the gospel ideal. So um, ultimately, sin is – well, as you said, it's not something positive. It's not something that ex has existence in itself so much as it is Correct. a disorder. And so it's you have to look at what is it a disorder of. You can't have your focus on the disorder rather than on the order. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. The catechism puts it this way. The catechism says mortal sin is a choice for a lesser good. Hmm. Notice the word good, right? Yeah. Mortal sin is the choice for a lesser good over the greater good, which is God. When we choose, and notice we're not choosing something that is inherently evil in itself. Rather, the evil is that we prefer the lesser good to the greater good. In other words, you could say the essence of all sin is idolatry. Right. It's, it's turning something that is not God into God, mm -hmm. right? We, we all worship something. We worship whatever we think is going to satisfy our deepest hunger. And when we think something less than God is going to satisfy my deepest hunger, we're worshiping a false God. We're worshiping an idol. And the healing of that idolatry is, is precisely learning that God, the true God and the true God alone can satisfy my deepest desire. Then and only then am I willing to let go of my God substitute and allow my heart to be redirected to what I really long for. Right. And there's a name for that. It's called prayer. Right. Uh, the, the fathers of the church tell us, and here I'm quoting Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. The fathers of the church tell us that prayer, properly understood, is nothing other than becoming a longing for God. That's conversion. At the end of this um, this third section, and this is probably the last point we'll touch on, um, he talks about – well, he, talk, he brings up this – idea of an artistic conscience is a phrase some people will use and he says it's really a kind of sensitivity yes. to beauty um uh but but it's an analogously called an artistic conscience he says sometimes that this artistic conscience can outstrip our moral conscience which creates disharmony in the person but then he goes on to say that uh go going back to what you were saying about the two touches he says that Artistic sensitivity should be tied to moral conscience and that this happens above all in the recognition that our sin actually physically touches Christ and also that we touch God in Christ's sacrifice. And he says the moral and artistic conscience come together when we find beauty in the suffering Christ. Can you, can you explain that a little bit, what he means by that? Because that's one of the more maybe, – maybe one of the more difficult points in here. Yes, it's, it's a remarkable point, and I do expand on it in my, my commentary. What audacity does the church have to call the day that Christ was crucified Good Friday? Mm -hmm. This is an in to, to, to the point that you're making, Thomas. What audacity does the church have to call the day in which the sum total of all evil was manifested in the crucifixion of the Son of God, the church calls that day good. Right. And if it is good, guess what else it is? Beautiful. Right. Even though that day was the manifestation of the fullest concentration of ugliness, of human yeah. ugliness. If that day is Good Friday, it's also Beautiful Friday. Because what is being manifested? I like got caught on my words here because of how astounding this mystery is. I mean, silence. There's only... Uh, 
before this mystery, we can only be silent. Mm. If I can try to put it in words, when the Son of God absorbs both in his body and in his soul the sum total of all ugliness. And, and let us remember the, the words of the prophet in the Old Testament, speaking of the one who, who we turned away from him because he was so ugly. He became so deformed when he took on our sin. He became so unattractive, so ugly, so repulsive, we turned our eyes away from him. Mm -hmm. What is happening here? The love of God is being manifest. The love that would lead to absorbing all of our ugliness so that we could be made beautiful. Who's at the foot of the cross? When Christ is absorbing all the ugliness of humanity, who's at the foot of the cross? The Immaculate One. What does it mean to be immaculate? It's right in Ephesians chapter 5. It means to be all beautiful. It means to be without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. John Paul II dedicated his theology of the body to Mary all beautiful. Right in the upper right-hand corner of page one of the theology of the body, it says, Toda pulchra es Maria. You are all yeah. beautiful, Mary. That's a quote adapted from the Song of Songs. And the date on which John Paul II began writing his theology of the body was December 8th. 1974, Feast of the Immaculate Conception. You are all beautiful, Mary. What's happening at the cross? The bridegroom is absorbing all the ugliness of humanity so that the bride might be all beautiful. Mary represents that bride at the foot of the cross. I used to be bugged, Thomas, by, by ornate crucifixes. Mm. Because I, I, I felt like I needed to see the ugliness. Huh. And I, I, here I just want to give a shout out to Mel Gibson. Uh, you know, he's, he's a mad genius, that man. Speaking of artists, right? Uh, there's mm -hmm. a madness about Mel Gibson. Uh, but, but most artists typically go mad because they see things that other people don't see. And, and I, I want to just give a shout out to Mel Gibson for showing us full on the ugliness of the scourging and the ugliness of the crucifixion of Jesus. Right. We need to see that. We need to know that. But I've come also to realize in this paradox, those artists who, who designed these ornate crucifixes with all kinds of beautiful gold around the edges and, and other symbols that, that you look at it and you say, wow, that's beautiful. That's not wrong either. It's both at the same time. And that's the paradox. John right. Paul has this marvelous reflection in his document, Novo Millennio Inuente, where he says, saints have pondered this, the, the, the utmost paradox of the fact that in the very cry of agony from the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The Son of God is also experiencing a perfect union with the Father, right. which is always bliss and ecstasy and saint after saint have have asked this question how can the agony and the ecstasy mingle here how can the agony and the ecstasy come together how can the ugliness and the beauty come together if yeah. they do not we are not saved hmm. he touches us in our ugliness with his beauty <laughs> that's right. what saves us. That's what saves us. Those are the two touches. 
Well, thank you for bringing this conversation to such a beautiful confusion. Uh, c- confusion. No, conclusion. <laughs> I hope it wasn't confusion. <laughs> I hope that wasn't wow, a, a Freudian slip. Wow, that was a complete... Slip. That was a that was a non Freudian slip. Uh, a c- beautiful okay. conclusion, uh, Christopher. Um, that was me being uh, my tongue being confused by the beauty. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, thank you so much. I, I really encourage people to pick up this book. Uh, God is beauty: a retreat on the gospel of on the gospel and art. And I'll note that um, our listeners can get this paperback uh, for twenty. 20- percent off the cover price if they go to uh, tobinstitute.shop and use the code culture, all caps. Um, and that will be the first book that you'll see on the homepage of the store. Again, tobinstitute.shop, code culture for 20% off of this book. Uh, the ebook and is also available. You can get as many, as many copies as you want at that 20% discount if you use that code. Yeah, if you want to start a discussion group uh, in your parish or something like that, that would be a great idea. Um, And uh, you also will be speaking about this somewhat at an upcoming event, will you not? That's right. Let me share a little bit about that. We have an artistic, creative event coming up May 13th to the 15th called Revealed. And we're doing something different here. We've all become familiar over the last two years with the typical online Catholic conference where we watch videos of speakers who are filming probably in their iPhone or something. And we've all benefited from that. But we've also realized, uh, gosh, can't we do something a little fresh? Do we, can, we, can we breathe a little fresh air into this whole format? And we're trying to do that. Uh, we are actually doing a live event in person that will be broadcast online for those who can't attend. There are only 80 tickets being sold to the in-person event. And uh, Mm. we have a great roster of speakers. We have Father Mike Schmitz. We have Matt Frad, who just agreed to come. We have Damon Owens. We have Jason Evert. We have um, Bobby and Jackie Angel. We have Jen Settle and Bill Dunahee and, and yours truly, Christopher West from the Theology Body Institute. We are all going to be gathering at a beautiful retreat center in southeastern Pennsylvania, where the Theology of the Body Institute offers its courses. And it'll be a live event for 80 people happening right there. But we're going to have several cameras roaming around, capturing it all and broadcasting it online. And you can sign up Great. for free to that. Um, To get the keynotes, those are all free, but there's also going to be a Mm. lot of behind-the-scenes action, conversations on couches, roundtable discussions, fireside chats, where, for example, Jeff Cavins and I, I forgot to mention he's coming, Jeff Cavins and I, or Father Mike Schmitz and I, or whatever combination, we'll be sitting down and the cameras will be right there, and we're just going to have a casual conversation. And we have some really great technology that's going to allow some creative interaction with our internet audience. So wow, check out all the ways awesome. you can participate. Uh, you have a link, right, Thomas, for that? Uh, yeah, it's revealedexperience.com. So I'll yes, link to all of this in the show notes in case people forget. But yeah. yeah. But the, people can always look in the description or the show notes for this episode and find links to everything discussed here as well. Yeah, um, revealedexperience.com, just to yeah. clarify, revealedexperience.com. Check it out. Yeah, that sounds great. Christopher, thank you so much. This was a really delightful conversation to have with you today. Thomas, I couldn't agree more. Very, very delightful. I have really enjoyed being with you, and thank you for giving real attention to the retreat so that we could have such an engaging conversation. Yeah, no problem. Well, um, I hope uh, everybody has enjoyed this episode, and we'll we'll pick up this book. And um, if you're new to the podcast, please do subscribe on our YouTube channel, or um, or subscribe in your podcast app of choice. And and uh, know that we have a lot of different arts uh, commentary, not just on the Catholic Culture Podcast, which you're listening to now, but on our on our podcast network as a whole. We have four different podcasts. Um, uh, in addition to this one, we have Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, where we discuss great cinema. Uh, and review current films, uh, our review of the upcoming movie, Father Stu, speaking of Mel Gibson, uh, will be coming out, um, I think, at the beginning of Holy Week. 
And uh, also, we have some great podcasts on the Church Fathers. We have Way of the Fathers with Mike Aquilina, which is a history podcast on the Fathers of the Church. And we have Catholic Culture audiobooks, where you can hear free, professional-quality audiobook readings of Catholic writings from the past 2,000 years, from the Church Fathers to St. John Henry Newman to papal encyclicals uh, to, you know, any, you know, Catholic poetry, any number of things you could imagine. So you can check out all of those at catholicculture.org slash podcast. And finally, if you'd like to help us out and help us keep these podcasts going, you can go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio, and your donation will be earmarked specifically for our audio productions. Thanks, everyone, for listening. God bless you. Uh, this may or may not be the last uh, Catholic Culture Podcast episode before Easter. If it, if it is, I wish you a blessed Holy Week and a, a glorious Easter. Easter.